Dear ladies and gentlemen, Sir Anthony Ritossa is absolutely delighted to welcome all 828 participants with us here at this first virtual keynote panel uh, live from Dubai and from other places around the world. Now, I will hand over the platform to our dear friend Hussein. Hussein, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you all panelists for, for taking the time to, to join us. So this panel uh, is initiated to address how family offices are dealing with the current crisis, what actions are they taking, uh, how are they uh, amplifying the positive values of family offices investments uh, for the good of humanity, but this is the address uh, of the title as well for this you know, the panel discussions, and we'll also highlight some of the available investments that should make a positive impact within uh, and pose this uh, pandemic. So given that we're short on time, I would like from every panelist to give a short introduction of Mohammed uh, or even us, uh, and then we start with uh, Badr. Hi guys, uh, my name is Badr Twedri. Uh, I'm the CIO of Twedri Holding, and uh, also I am uh, a director in the wealth management with Mythic Capital. Uh, my name is Rayan Qutub. Um, I am the chairman of Nama Al Baraka Holding. Again, Nama Al Baraka Holding is focused on two key areas. One is the logistics ecosystem, uh, either from assets perspective, from technology perspective, or advisory. And uh, we're focused as well on digital transformation related uh, projects. Uh, my name is Adil Zaruni. I uh... I run a couple of family businesses, one of which is uh, Zaruni Mitz Investments. The, the other one is for a branch of the ruling family in Sharjah, uh, mainly in the sectors of uh, healthcare, education, technology, financial services, and uh, FMB. I am Nadim so I am the founder and CEO of Fund Ourselves. Fund Ourselves is a UK-based marketplace for short-term credit. So basically allowing people to, to invest and lend other people in the UK. So yeah, my name is Adam Najaj. Um, I am the Chief Investment Officer for His Highness Sheikh Hamdan Mohammed Mohammedan Mahyan. Um, primarily was the Foreign Direct Investment Officer before that. I also hold roles in AD Investment as the Chief Strategy Officer. Um, which that entity mainly focuses on the defense industry, FMB, oil and gas, and um, uh, logistics and supply chain. And at the private office, we tend to the private affairs of His Highness um, uh, created to grave. And as a byproduct of that, we deal with the portfolio, which has exposure internationally and locally. Uh, my name is Benjamin Blumenthal. I'm the CEO of US Venture Broadcast. We uh, distribute uh, interesting technologies to investors and family offices uh, around the world. Um, and I'm very pleased to be a part of the panel today um, to also discuss uh, interesting and new technologies that are emerging out of America um, that uh, are, are specifically designed to help curb the spread of the coronavirus and to strengthen public health on a worldwide scale. So thank you very much for having us. I would like to start with you, Adam. There was a study published by the International Family Office Portal on the, on, on the reaction of the family investments firms on the current uh, pandemic. And interestingly, 60% of the participants are optimistic about the future. M many of them uh, are exploring investment opportunities, mainly in tech stocks and private equity. And given that you're operating a family office and you're dealing with many others as well in the region, can you tell me how are you reacting to the current pandemic? I mean, myself, I, I don't see a lot of activity going on there because everything is freezed almost. But Shall we expect to see more actions taken, whether it is in private equity, VCs, distressed debt, or other sectors? Um, I think that's a good question. And again, I think that all dependent on how you are running your family office prior to this epidemic. Um, and I guess some people had exposure to the money markets and some had exposure in many different private equity deals that they were, they were leading in or, or co-investing in. For me personally, um, <clears throat> it hasn't affected us so much. And the reason being is one, we saw something coming and two, um, a lot of our transactions, you can say, had more of a focus on FMB, supply chain logistics, and a few of those sectors and industries that haven't been hit so hard 
but actually have been accelerated in terms of growth and operations. Um, for us, we're pretty lean. So uh, we're not a family office that, that kind of sprays and prays into different opportunities. Um, and I think for me, and just to kind of keep the, the answer really short, that there are plenty of opportunities that we're seeing at the moment and keeping very active with um, when it comes to distressed assets and some distressed deals, special situations that are existent now locally and internationally. Um, and I think also from the AD investment front, where it is a holding co, it, it, it also um, accelerated a lot of our current portfolio um, in terms of operations when it comes to our media company that we own, uh, Zany Media, that, that operates in um, numerous different sectors in production and content management, which has been uh, increasing in demand uh, in the last month, shall we say, whether it's from public sector or private sector campaigns. Um, and I guess, you know, for me, when we're dealing with other family offices that we're co-investing with, and, and I've been doing this through the, the private investment group, where we've seen a lot of activity within those same industries I've mentioned, when it comes to last mile logistics and technologies that increase the efficiency there, reverse logistics, um, health tech we're trying to keep an eye on now because we feel there's an opportunity there. But again, one of the problems you have as a family office like ours is the know-how um, in, in, in one a specific industry. And so we're trying to gather ourselves with some specialists and some service providers that's going to be enabling us for due diligence on different projects that we're looking at on a private equity basis. Uh, Ryan, you have managed and been on board of, of companies of different sectors of the economy, whether it is the real estate, industrial, uh, the healthcare, logistics, uh, FMCG. Let me, let me first uh, start by asking you, how do you think the shape of the economy uh, will look like when it reopens? This, I think this is the $1 trillion question. Um, uh, I, I think no one knows, but I can tell you what, uh, what I feel. Um, now, I think definitely no one should be surprised about this situation. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about COVID-19, but I'm talking generally about a potential um, slowdown in the business, either uh, recession or depression that could follow because the, uh, the boom ha happened in 2008, uh, 2010. It continued for some time and everyone was expecting a slowdown. It was not a, a matter of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of if it's going to happen, but it was a matter of, uh, of when it's going to happen. So I think... Um, uh, what, what is coming across in many industries, as I'm seeing it, that some people were more prepared than others. I think uh, people who were more prepared are, are, are in a better position uh, today. Um, um, definitely, when you look at the economies, there is an old economy and there is a new economy. And I see a lot of new economies related to uh, logistics, e-commerce, uh, technology-based uh, economies are witnessing uh, a boom and an upside uh, now. So uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's something that was foreseen for some time. It was just missing what would be the trigger. And if you looked at all recessions in the past, it was always related to a trigger uh, in a way or sure. another. I think the trigger here was COVID-19, uh, which no one was expecting, uh, I, would, I would say. But... Um, I think we're in a situation where, uh, you know, there are opportunities and you have to prioritize between preserving what you have and in terms of managing your growth as well. Basically, there are businesses that are less, there are businesses that are booming and those are the ones that I've been, I'm exposed to are definitely in, in, in healthcare that are more oriented towards um, long-term stays, uh, ventilated uh, patients. Uh, businesses that have healthcare, uh, healthcare businesses that are less towards uh, day surgery and uh, uh, and so on. Uh, FMCG has do has done well. So frozen foods uh, in general have done quite quite good. Technology, uh, few of these that are less dependent on Chinese supply chain. Uh, ha, have been able to adapt themselves and, and probably are cash rich enough to uh, to to readjust with 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 the new economy. And let let me highlight that there is a new economy. I mean, for things to go back to where it was in 
as, as a normal, normal environment, this will be years before we get there. Uh, let, let us be realistic that both governments and uh, individuals will have less paying power after this. The gap between the rich and the poor will be substantial. Uh, and, and accordingly, how, how would the world work for the next uh, two, three years uh, is, is something in the, in, in the unknown. Evaluations are going to change. The amount of money available in the market is going to change. Consumer behavior is going to change. And, and to adjust uh, to this new, I would call, era. Uh, and an era, I mean, I mean anywhere between two to four years. Uh, is something that, uh, in my opinion, a lot of people have to be very cautious with. So to be driven by the fact that the markets are really low, to be driven by the fact that a few industries are being uh, leveraging of the situation, I think we should be cautious in that a lot of behavior, uh, consumer and investor behaviors is going to change. And accordingly, nobody really knows how would this uh, shape up uh, in, uh, into the future? It is uh, probably sad, but what you've mentioned is truly realistic uh, for the world post-corona. Uh, uh, let me move to the last family office member we have here, Badr uh, Tweedri. Uh, Badr, you remember our panels since the past three, four years have been focused on how, especially on how many axes are we doing on the investments, 10x, 20x, especially when you invest in new startups. Now, probably with the, with the uh, COVID mentality should uh, uh, or could have changed. Where are you focusing nowadays? Actually, uh, there is a say in Arabic that says, uh, I don't know how you explain that in English, but uh, and we we were well prepared before the pandemic. Uh, we have invested a lot of our most of our portfolio in, in in technology last year, and we have seen an unbelievable growth in these uh, applications, whether it's a service applications or whether it's a grocery applications like Nana. Uh, we've seen. Uh, 10 to 12 X's growth in uh, in each one of these uh, technology applications. Also, uh, uh, part of our portfolio, which is uh, an, an industrial part, have seen uh, a substantial amount of growth. Uh, we have a couple of factories that does masks and sanitizers and uh, and. Uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, a lot of disposable for the healthcare. It's been uh, it's been doing extremely well. Uh, however, uh, our we have cut uh, back uh, on our real estate exposure uh, two years ago. Uh, financial markets we have cut back uh, a lot of our exposures by end of uh, 2019. So uh, I think we are uh, in a in a in a in a good shape, uh, at least for now. Benjamin, let me move to you uh, now. Um, you have been a private investor, you've been an investor, you've, you've dealt with VCs, with PEs, and now you're trying to come up with a product that is for the good of the, uh, uh, especially given now the situation where we are living in, uh, you're trying to do some kind of positive impact. So. Can you tell me more about the products that you're coming up with now? Sure, thank you. Um, I, I really have to just tip my hat for a moment to Adil because what he was saying was, was, was quite right. In America, we're calling it the new normal. So, you know, when we come out of this and people start leaving their homes, it is not going to go back exactly to the way it was. There will be a new normal. Um, after there was terrorism on the airlines, we all accepted that we had to arrive at the airport early to go through security. Um, there were metal detectors that would uh, have to give us the sense of security to getting into the airplanes. And so similarly, one of the technologies that we have identified, and I should say that my mission is to find 
life-saving technologies and technologies that are specifically designed to safeguard the public welfare and then try to bring that to uh, the world. And um, so one of the technologies that we have found is what we call a medical evaluation gateway. And just like a, a metal detector at the, um, at the airport, uh, this particular detector, as you walk through it, it detects human health. So it can detect your temperature, that's easy. Um, it can detect shortness of breath. It can detect lung uh, congestion. Uh, it can detect the level of oxygen in your blood to determine whether or not. Um, it can detect your heart rate and determine whether your heart rate is elevated or not. And it does all of this in around five to eight seconds. So imagine if you wanted to go to a movie theater or you wanted to go to a sports arena for a sporting event, or you wanted to go to a hotel and just sit and have a, a cup of coffee. At the entranceway, you would go and you would pass through the archway and this medical evaluation gateway or this health gate would take your biologics, biological vital readings and give you a green light or a red light as to whether or not you were able to enter that environment. And I believe that this type, of, uh, this type of health gate, this type of medical evaluation gateway is going to be a part of our new normal. When we go to a concert or when we go to a movie, just as we now accept that you go to the airport and you need to plan a little bit more time to get through security, that we're gonna go to public spaces and we're going to have to pass through a gateway that will be sure that when you sit in your hotels and your favorite restaurants and your movie theaters and your sports stadiums, that when you sit there, you know that not only the people next to you have been medically screened, but also the people bringing you the food, that you, you want that sense of security. And that is one of the technologies that, uh, that we, are, we are looking at. The name of the company is Solder Technologies. The device is called Symptom Sense, and more information um, is available about this on our, our site, usventurebroadcast.com. We, we try to bring new technologies to, uh, um, uh, to the world. And, and quite frankly, this, along with other companies and other technology companies, they're looking for, uh, the state of New York has already started buying these units, right? They're in the field, they're, they're, uh, they're starting, uh, some of the American sporting stadiums have started uh, ordering them as well. Um, and the company now is looking for three separate types of partners. They're looking for customers like the city of Dubai or the city of Monaco or, you know, the, uh, the ski lifts of Switzerland because places that are heavily dependent upon tourism need to assure their guests of a potential secure environment. They need to provide that level of security. The company is also looking for distribution partners. It's a very, very large world. And every single city and every single hotel and even the hospitals would like to know in advance of a person walking in whether that person has an elevated heart rate or a lung problem so they don't put someone who has COVID-19 next to the young man who just broke his arm. Um, so there are certain screenings that have to happen. So they're looking for customers. The company's looking for distribution partners. And I was informed this morning by the CEO that they're gonna be opening up a $20 million uh, investment round um, in the coming days. Um, so they're looking for financial partners and they would like not to have that with one or two people, but they would like to have four or five different investors and family offices that represent Asia, Western Europe, maybe even Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and Latin America as well, since the balance of the investors are American. So um, Benjamin, probably after the conference, uh, this part of the discussion, you can even have a discussion with uh, our family offices here in the room. Uh, probably you'll find a lot of interest. Uh, let, let me move uh, to, to Nadim. Uh, Nadim, so your, your company is called Fund Our Summits. And I think uh, probably the most thing that is needed now is funding. We have a lot of short and, and liquidity. A lot of companies need a credit. Uh, do you think you can solve this problem now? 
Um, I think uh, we uh, we really need to help each other at this time, right? So uh, it depends on how many companies will uh, will stay alive and will continue to survive and will last until after uh, all of this go uh, goes away, right? Um, that is that will uh, depend. That will show us how um, the the economy will recover. How fast will it recover? Will it be a V shaped or will it be a U shaped or will it be an L shaped? So if um, if uh, people go uh, bust and companies goes bust now, then um, it, it's more likely that we are going through to an L shape, right? If uh, if the more companies we have surviving and the more more businesses, more people surviving this um, tough time or unprecedented times, the the quicker we can recover all of us as um, it's it's one world now or it's more like one big country, like the whole world, right? Um, things change very quickly from one country to another. So the, the, the more we can sustain and uh, keep companies alive and keep people, uh, let people survive this difficult time, the quicker we can recover. So uh, one of the, uh, the ways we can help is um, issuing credit for the short term to help companies and to help uh, SMEs and businesses and uh, small coffee shops and so on pass uh, this tough time that they cannot operate and so on. And uh, and get to the uh, to the other side. So as soon as the, uh, the 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 restrictions are lifted, then everybody can go back out again, have more of a normal life, right? And then that will help the economy to recover as quickly as possible. We are we are more of a marketplace. So we uh, investors can come in and open investment account, and then uh, borrowers as well can come to us, and they can start applying for loans, and they can borrow as a business or they can borrow as an individual. But the key thing is that it's all for short term, like 12 months uh, term loans. Um, so um, uh, I'm a business, I need short term funding. I can come to uh, market, fund ourselves and I can apply for a loan. I can get the funding from uh, Adam, for example, and, um, and, and get the, the, the capital I need to, uh, to, to last this period. Um, but, but, but we need more capital because the demand now is huge. Like all, um, all restaurants are shut down or coffee shops are shut down all kind of like uh, retail that are non-essential like clothing and uh, are, are all shut down right um so um we, we, there, there's a huge need so some sectors are not affected like the supermarkets and so on and uh, healthcare but uh, some other sectors are, are affected but all of these sectors will, will come back to life again very quickly if we if we help them now the help is is of course we have to be able to provide the capital in a uh, secure way, in a regulated way, in a regulated environment, but also go governments now are issuing uh, securities, which which uh, which to give more confidence. So, for example, here in the UK, the government is um, is is guaranteeing up to 80%, and maybe soon it will be even 100% of the loans being issued to businesses. So, if an investor putting, say, for example, 10, 20 million to issue to businesses, qualifying business that are it being issued these 10, 20 million loans, they're secured by the UK government. So mm -hmm. if the if in any event that the uh, the person the, the business goes under uh, in six months time instead of like surviving the 12 months time, then the the UK government will ship in and uh, and compensate. Um, but it's not just that we also issue loans, short term loans for 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 uh, people who are bit, been put in kind of uh, uh, for low or short term uh, leave or unpaid leave. So that when companies go back up and running, then these people can go back and continue to help the economy and so on. And these are also, we're, we're guaranteeing with 100% guarantee as well with the provisioning we have. So um, uh, like uh, as an investor, what we need as investors, we, we need to find the best opportunities where we can help out, we can add value, we can kind of stand together and support each other. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to lose, right? We want to, um, to have the best returns as well. We want to... Uh, to, 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 to our portfolio, we need the positive return on our portfolio. We don't want to go into the negative and the losses and so on. So we need to help each other and also at the same time in a way that we can have sustainable and growing returns for our portfolio. So um. uh, thank you. Thank you, Nadim. Um, Adel, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so you were telling me about some of the investments that have been benefiting from the current environment, especially with COVID-19. But I know that you also have so many investments uh, that have positive impact also on the society. And tell me that through the past four or five weeks, what or, or, or how, how are you probably thinking differently for the next stage to come? 
So, um, I have been bullish in the last, uh, say, six months into the subject of uh, mental health. And apparently, uh, and, and providing these kind of services uh, uh, online, uh, the hindering element to such a business prevailing as a, as, as a model in this region uh, are rules and regulations. And what I'm seeing now, there is a huge uh, expeditation on, on rules and regulations to entertain healthcare services online, inclusive of mental health. I do believe there is a substantial growth in mental health need, especially under the pandemic. And it will continue to be a hot item for the next three to three to five years. And, and it is much needed. And, uh, and, and this is a, a field that I, once I stabilize the existing businesses, which is going to take a while, uh, the next three to, si three, to, four, to, to three to six months, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to give that a, a substantial push. Um, more and above, uh, I'm trying to think about the, the problem of uh, the so many people that have been let go. Uh, that the demand for these people is not going to come back very, very soon. There will be a substantial drop of, on, on salaries and income across the board globally. And that won't come back, in my opinion, not in the next probably three years. Uh, so the challenge will be uh, how could we... Uh, and of, of course, uh, definitely led by, by governments, uh, be able to help sustainably uh, both uh, categories uh, of, of, of the community. Now, uh, of course, these are big statements, big, uh, big desires, uh, but I intend to focus really on those two things. Thank you, Adel. Uh, Ryan, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, Same. great. So let me ask you this question from, from one of our participants. Uh, in fact, this is the kind of question I wanted to ask you as well. Uh, and the question is from Hadi Far on how, how do you see the future of education, mainly for primary and high schools in terms of investments and future business? I think uh, education is definitely is one of the key sectors that has been suffering for the last uh, how many years uh, in terms of its business model. I've been involved in setting up traditional universities like Babson College in Saudi Arabia. I've been involved in setting schools. I think it's a very expensive uh, model. It's not fully updated. And I think we have been uh, in a situation where there is a forced digital transformation today where there was a lot of questions in the past about uh, e-learning and the efficiency and the effectiveness of e-learning and the credibility of e-learning. So I think uh, now you see the kids today going through the virtual uh, schools, universities, e-training, e webinars now is a great new uh, channel uh, like uh, Zoom and others. So I think definitely uh, the life after uh, COVID-19 will not look the same because people are already uh, trying it and believing in it. Uh, now, personally, I'm involved in um, the distribution of Coursera in Saudi Arabia and the region here uh, with the government. So um, there is big appetite uh, now for, from many uh, from many divisions within the government uh, to look into e-solutions, e-learning solutions as, as uh, a way of improving the quality and improving the exposure of quality education and as well reducing cost of the business because cost of education and healthcare always in any economy is the highest and the issue is always about the quality of output so i think definitely uh, one of the biggest winners now today in terms of education uh, or many of the biggest winners in terms of the economy post covid-19 is education uh, when it comes to e education e learning Thank you, Ryan. Uh, I have also a question here for uh, Badr. Uh, the question is from 
uh, Danielos. Uh, so you have mentioned that you have really focused your portfolio towards technology and have already seen great growth. Uh, while our technology adoption is definitely given, how do you see the technology enabling businesses faring in the next two to four years, given the salaries and consumption will be in decline? And uh, she's especially interested in education and whether the comeback of digital education will hit back at the digital one. I mean, uh, you know, the, the types of technologies and applications that we invest in are, uh, are you know, something uh, necessary. So we invest in necessity uh, services, uh, we invest in necessity uh, technologies, uh, we try to focus on necessity and services too. So for example, everybody needs uh, groceries. And, you know, the government now is pushing people to stay home. And uh, we've seen uh, a 15x uh, growth in, in, in our application, Nana, in, in Saudi Arabia only. Uh, all, other, uh, uh, all of our other technology investments were towards uh, services. And, uh, um, and we're seeing a, a great growth. I mean... Uh, we're not going like uh, into uh, deep tech uh, platforms or deep tech uh, uh, applications or something like uh, very, you know, sophisticated like AIs and all that. No, we're going for uh, mostly basic services and necessities, and uh, and we we feel that for the next uh, for the next two to three years, uh, those applications are going to be. Uh, worth uh, something uh, in the near future. Uh, we've also done a couple of uh, HR services uh, as an application. Um, we've done fintech. We've done, uh, you know, uh, our our technology portfolio is doing extremely well, uh, as I said. And I think we're very happy of uh, the new allocations that we've been doing for the last three years. Thank you, brother. I have. Uh... From the question also from uh, a friend of ours, and he's an active participant in the Tosas of uh, Family Offices conferences. Uh, he's asking, did you see what happened in the US in the past 72 hours on WTI prices? Yes, I think all of us have seen this as a catalyst for pretty much a shutdown in shale uh, exploration, probably, uh, besides a lot of negative uh, uh, negativity with uh, credit uh, financial, and financial markets uh, impact. So uh, I don't know if, if uh, I would take this question to you, uh, Adam, uh, on this, um, especially when it comes to credit and the financial market impact, how do you see the drop of WTI to almost negative $40? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, uh, so this is from Ricky, Ricky Hosseini, who was asking uh, the, the, the the actions that, that we've seen in oil prices over the past uh, 72 hours after it dropped below zero for the first time ever, how do you see the impact on credit and financial markets? Of course, you're going you're gonna to see impacts. And I think also people have to see the logical reasoning behind the price drop, you know. So the oil production was still going on and storage was being fulfilled. And when there is no more to store, and not much being consumed, um, it, it does lead to uh, <laughs> to drops like that. Um, I think for for us, dependent on what happens next when everything opens up, um, and dependent on how the oil companies start to release that production, uh, will then impact the price. Um, if it's done slowly, then it could really increase it extremely high. And if it does get put back into the market really quickly then then obviously the prices will in my opinion reach back to the maximum about 40 50 and I you know when they talk about money markets in general although we don't have much exposure in that um, I would say that it's completely normal um, for them to be impacted some have been impacted well in, in some sense but I don't really see us having any uh, reasoning behind looking at that because we've not had exposure per se in that in that industry per se um, you know, most of our kind of, you know, I guess allocations the last month or two have been towards um, injecting capital, for example, into four factories 
um, above Porto and Braga, who were actually servicing Inditex, uh, Zara, and they stopped production lines. And we started making PPEs for the healthcare uh, system in Portugal. And now we're kind of trying to supply elsewhere. We've just done Switzerland. And again, air decontamination technologies. Um, we've taken a big look into that and we've invested into Atmotech, um, which is atmosphere technologies. And they basically um, develop devices using HEPA filter, medical grade HEPA filters, um, uh, ionization and UVC lighting that basically allows, you know, a lot of air decontamination processes to take place efficiently. But I mean, in terms of money markets, in terms of what happened the last day or two, um, you know, I think logical reasoning is behind it. Um, and again, we're not really exposed there, so. Yeah, thank you, Adam. I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, gentlemen, we're just running out of time. Vanessa, if you can just give us a couple of minutes uh, for closing remarks from uh, our panelists. Uh, one minute or less, and, and then we start with Benjamin. Gentlemen, I, I wanted to, and ladies, I wanted to, to share with you some information that recently came across my desk, um, both from governmental sources here in the United States and from the health workers at the Center for Disease Control. Everyone has been talking about flattening the curve, but the reality is it's not really a curve, it's a wave. And they're essentially talking about four separate distinct waves. The first wave was March, April, and May, which was very difficult because it was new for all of us. And that was, that's where we are right now. The second wave is June, July, and August. This is going to be the lightest one where people will be out, they'll be moving around because it's very, very hot. And people generally don't get the flu during the summertime. But then comes September, October, November, and December, January, February. And if there's no active vaccine that's out, up, and dis up and running and distributed, then we could be facing a very, very harsh winter, a terrible winter. And social distancing is really going to be helpful, but it's, it's, it's going to be a lockdown mechanism again. And the people that are in the U.S. who are responsible for sort of maintaining public stability, they don't want to scare the public. That's obvious that you wouldn't want to come out and simply tell people you're going to be locked in your houses from September to March. Um, there would be a riot and, and there wouldn't be much you could do about it. It would make the situation worse. So I think that in all of everything that I've heard today, um, and especially in those of you who are looking at decontamination technologies and, 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 and different elements, I would encourage you to continue investing in those heavily so that the world is better prepared. But as of right now, I think it's important as you look forward into the strategy of how you want to deploy your capital, I think it's vital to understand that if we had a vaccine today, it would take months to distribute it and vaccinate the populations. So we're heading towards a second wave, which is light, and a third and fourth wave, which could be severe. And I think you need to add that into your thinking as you build your strategies for financial capital expansion as well. So I leave you with that thought and I'm available should anyone wish to discuss further. Thank you, Benjamin. Let's hope that Gilead, Johnson & Johnson and all other companies working on a vaccine can find uh, a vaccination very soon or at least uh, a treatment uh, for now. And Nadim, uh, closing remarks, please. Um, I think we, uh, we all should just be ready. Um, th there are some indications that it may be a U-shaped, but it can also lead to an L-shaped if, uh, like, for example, what Benjamin was just uh, mentioning here happened and it continue to have different cycles and so on. So we, we just have to be prepared again. And um, just to, like uh, the stronger we are all um, and we, we are all ready to, to stand up on our feet again and uh, go up and go, uh, get, get, go running again, then that will be better for um, all economies or businesses and uh, consumers and everything will go back to normal quicker. So um, we, we just need to be ready now. We need to, um, to, to keep uh, the infrastructure as ready as possible and keep businesses running and keep uh, the economy running. Uh, we don't want the wheel to stop. If the wheel stops, then it will take a lot, a lot longer to make it rotate again. And that will, uh, will, be, will have a huge impact on uh, not just one country, but probably uh, all country in this uh, globalized um, economy. So, yeah. yeah I think um, when you talk about uh, family offices, I think preserving wealth is one of the key priorities always. So I think you want to um, stress, or I want to stress that 
you know, we need to look at new opportunities, but it's very important as well to see how we can preserve what we already invested in, how to reinvent it, uh, uh, how to develop it, uh, to, to adapt to the new normal, as the team was saying. So uh, looking at the future is great, but again, how to preserve what you have is extremely important. Um, I think the other uh, reflection is that, again, uh, what we are in today is not the new norm yet. So we should not get too excited about the 15 and 20 Xs. I think uh, once the pandemic is, is over, there will be uh, some return to where we were. It, uh, so I think we just have to project the future and be a bit uh, balanced in terms of how we believe. It shouldn't be a pendulum effect. We, we go from traditional life to uh, a total virtual life, I think the future will be somewhere in between and we have to be ready for it. The third comment I want to highlight is that cash is king today for business. Get whatever money you can get in the company and make sure uh, uh, that will keep you for, uh, for, uh, for some time. Uh, as they say, pl uh, plan for the worst and wish for the best. Uh, and uh, take care of people and again, innovate, innovate, innovate. Thank you. Uh, that, that was great, uh, Rayan. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your note and what you said. But uh, as they say, uh, you know, crisis uh, makes uh, the greatest. You know, when you, when you see crisis and you know uh, where to invest and where to balance your portfolio. I'm not saying to go out crazy and buy everything that you can see, but you, you, you still have the balance. If you have... If we didn't have a well-diversified portfolio, uh, we would be uh, in a really bad shape right now. If we would have been like other family offices uh, doing real estate and equities and all that, and uh, we will be in a really bad shape too. You know, a lot of traditional businesses right now are suffering. They are having really bad time, and we are enjoying, you know, part of our portfolio is enjoying a, a great uh, growth. However, uh, the most important at this time, I think, I believe that the most important thing right now is, is, is staying healthy and staying safe and just try your best to help, you know, other people. Let, let's just not think about our success and our wealth and our family offices or whatever. It's a, it's a great time right now to donate to charities and to do a lot of good things. Uh, I've, I've been encouraging all my friends and all the family offices that I deal with that I know to come on guys, donate, you know, wh wh whatever you have. It doesn't have to be substantial amount of money. You know, everybody can do what they can do uh, on, on, on their size. Uh, in, in, in the last three months, we have donated more than $2 million worth of disposables, uh, healthcare disposables, uh, food baskets, uh, uh, even in our technology uh, uh, partners, in our technology applications, we've done uh, free, you know, deliveries. You know, we didn't take it. You know, we didn't take advantage of the pandemic. We even gave people a free deliveries to their groceries, to their baskets, to their. Uh... So all I'm saying is, sometimes it's it's good to go back and think about other people around you in the world, uh, the unfortunate people, the people who has suffered from this pandemic, you know, that made them really feel bad, you know, financially and socially and all that. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's great to make, you know, all these exes, but also it's more important to think about other people, you know, that's unfortunate. That's uh, very true, but uh, I, I, I'm very confident that the world will come together on this, uh, especially here in our region with uh, Ramadan just a few days. Uh, ahead of us, uh, Adel, a fire, final thoughts, please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, hey, I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, I really like to uh, to salute the the, the panel. Uh, it's, a, it's a great mix and, and great views. In my opinion, um, let I, I think at least me, I'm taking a position of not trying to take the world today as to be the norm. It's a, these are exceptional times. It's, it's against our nature. There is human nature that is in place. Uh, pandemics happened before and people somehow forgot about them relatively fast because as humans, 
we tend to we are social creatures and we tend to want to see that the future is better than the past today we are not being social and we don't think the future is better than, uh, is better uh, we don't believe that the future is better than today or the past so w which is against our nature and accordingly you know the reality of today uh, is not really a gauge for me on what is what would the future look like and and since i'm confused i wouldn't try to to take decisions while being confused yes we might re understand that there are essentials in life and today those essentials are more cleaner clearer than than before and accordingly if i am ever to diversify i need to learn lessons from the from the reality of today that is on the one side on the second i don't think the world will wait for a vaccine flu doesn't have a vaccine till now and it is as old as the, the dinosaurs if not older than the dinosaurs I, i what i believe the solution is are just medicines that will reduce the impact of the virus as we got used to the flu we take panadols and we take you know all kind of medicines to reduce the symptoms there will be medicines there are actually already today medicines that reduces the the, the impact of of the virus hitting hitting us it is so sticky so it's everywhere and you know taking it out of our 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 life is going to be almost impossible so i think we just need to get used to this and isolate the elderly I do I am taking the assumption that it is a W wave but I don't think the next wave is going to be similar to this wave. I think the next wave we will need to accept uh that treating symptoms is more important than finding a vaccine and we have to accept that people don't go out and start making income they will die out of hunger there will be riots it will be very a, a very dangerous world and and it will be a very difficult decision for politicians to take uh to 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 continue to lock in people into their into their homes <clears throat> and also it's equally di di difficult for them to ask uh to ask people to go back to work because nobody is willing to accept that casualties will come out of this so it's a really ha hard decision for everyone and i can't envy anybody uh, that is that is responsible of taking such decisions so that, that that is that is what i wanted to share with everyone thank you ada Thank you thank you very much for these thoughts. Uh, Adam uh and then you now. I think uh I'll echo what uh what Adam has said. I think it's a well diverse panel and, and, and I think uh, for me it's been interesting to hear everyone's insights. I think my final thought is you know uh, this is definitely a daunting time for anyone whether you're working in a very large corporate MNC an SME or a startup. <clears throat> and as investors you are also facing uh, different uh, different you know barriers to decision making in general i think my final thought is that no matter what happens we all have to keep plowing through the situation um whether you're in the middle of a startup whether you're in the middle of growing your company internationally or whether you're in the middle of a transaction in general um for us we we will always have to find solutions and pivot regardless of whether it's a covid-19 situation or if it's another economic situation that's impacted the economy whether it's a recession a depression whatever i think for me as human beings we always have to be cautious of who's around us and um we always talk about impact investment and we talk about sustainability and we talk about these great things that have a social impact i think now is the time to really look at your investments and see how you can keep employment at a certain level i think you you can leave people working from home i've seen a lot of companies um fire people rather than trust them and and not mac micromanage and let them work from home and i think it's just about a change of lifestyle change of thinking change of operations it's just a bunch of changes that can be scary but at the same time for me i see them quite as quite exciting um i think what i would tell everyone that's watching um if we're talking about the gcc or we're talking about the uae um we have a mentality of that we're all on the same boat and today i had a very good conversation with the guys at Dubai FDI <clears throat> and you know he echoed something to me in the lines of whether it's public sector or government sector we're on the same boat here i think everyone has to be supportive of each other's operations and companies and mandates so i i just hope that i can participate in whatever way to my fellow colleagues on the panel um or or anyone else 
there's anything I can do that can help accelerate, move, or, or, you know, I'm more than happy to look at whatever opportunities are on the table. I'm keeping my mind more open than I was before. Uh, and I'm not scared to touch in uh, sectors, industries, or movements that I'm not used to or not so familiar with. Uh, Anthony, uh, Sir Anthony, would you like to uh, just put any final remarks for this panel discussion? Thanks for that. I think it's been um, a fantastic panel session. So thank you so much to all the esteemed panelists for coming together. Uh, I think it's. I think some of the takeaways that I've seen here is um, helping others seem to be the the greatest form of wealth as well. So. It's it, and we've touched on a lot of different topics as well, so it's been really great. And um, I'd love to hear, perhaps, to throw it out to um, the the participants that have uh, that have listening in. Perhaps they can let us know if um, uh, how if they'd like to have more of these panels, if it'd like to be on a weekly or every two weeks, or it'd be great to get some feedback on that as well. But yeah, thank you, thanks panelists, thanks for everyone. Thank you, uh, Anthony. And yes, we'll get uh, all these comments from participants. They can even drop us uh, messages on LinkedIn or by email. And from my side, I hope that we will, if not a vaccination, at least to find a treatment that could cure us from this virus as soon as possible. Because I would like for all of us to be uh, on the 24th of June in uh, Monaco, participating in Ritosa's family office investment office over there. I missed a gathering with most of you guys. Uh, most of us have been on the same panels before, hanging out together. So let's hope this nightmare will end soon and we will all manage to get back uh, together. Thank you very much for participating in this panel. So many interesting thoughts uh, and hopefully we will continue doing these panels until uh, we get post this uh, COVID-19. Thank you very much. As Sir Anthony mentioned, um, our next uh, virtual panel will be on May 5th. So for a registration to that panel as a panelist or as a participant, please um, e email us at vanessa at ritosafamilyoffice.com. Um, most of you have my details and, um, and also again on behalf of um, the high patronage of His Excellency Sheikh Abdulaziz um, Al Khalifa, we really wanted to thank everyone uh, for participating and again Hussein, thank you so much for being an incredible anchor and an incredible moderator and we cannot wait for you to be chairing one of Sir Anthony's uh, conferences as ZAP. <laughs>